Thanks very much for inviting me to MobileFest. Uh, uh, today I'm going to try to say a few words about where some of the mobility ideas originally came from, how they affect children, and maybe uh, a little bit about how the future is going to turn out. And what I'd like to do is first to look at perhaps the most important mobile technology that's ever been invented. And we could think of this technology as wanting to encompass the entire organization of human knowledge. We want, want it to be solid state and mobile, of course. We like extremely high resolution, high contrast, ambient lighting display. You can use anywhere in the world. Really easy to use basic uh, interface from getting from one place to another in it. It's got to have a wide range of the kinds of knowledge it can hold. It needs to have unlimited battery life. And we want it to be biodegradable so it won't pollute the, the planet. And of course what I'm talking about here is basic organization of knowledge which is called the book. So this technology has already been invented. It has already changed human civilization in many ways. And uh, it's very difficult to do better than a book using computer technology today. We can do some of the things that a book can do better. We can do uh, some of the things a book can do uh, more cheaply, but it's hard to do everything that a, that a book can do. So it's a good thing to think about as we compare what our new technologies are going to do. And when the book was invented, people thought about the future of printing and about the best they could think of in the 19th century when the Industrial Revolution came in that we'd be able to go from a hand wielded printing press to something run by steam and then by electricity uh, to really make inexpensive books and lots of different kinds of books. But in fact what has actually happened to the surprise of most publishers and most makers of printing presses is electronic technologies came along and completely changed the dynamics so we didn't have something that is a slightly cheaper version of a big electrically or steam driven web printing but what we had is something that people can carry around with them and do printing on their desktops and so the future here was quite unexpected and in many ways still is many publishers are still grappling with something that they were told was going to happen thirty years ago but they didn't believe it and much of the same has happened with content. So the Catholic Church did not try to stamp out the printing press in the 15th century because uh, it was being used to print Bibles and that seemed to be okay. But within 50 years, printers started making much smaller books that people could carry around, much uh, less expensive books. And these books uh, were not about religious subjects but about ideas of all kinds many from the Greeks and the, and the Romans and about a hundred years later the huge change in thought from the Bible happened with Galileo and then with Newton and a hundred years after that we had huge changes in the way governance and uh, social organization was thought of so uh, whatever people thought the printing press was uh, in the mid 15th century it turned out to be something completely different and most of us today think this was a good thing uh, I think it's a good thing but it certainly changed almost everything about the way the 15th century thought and did things. Ann McLuhan pointed out something really important which most of us do not pay attention to and don't think about. He said, we shape our tools and then they reshape us. And Thoreau said a kind of a more pessimistic version of this much earlier than McLuhan. He says, we become the tools of our tools. So once we make technologies, uh, we wind up starting to serve them in various ways. Uh, so we can think of McLuhan's way of looking at it as optimistic and Thoreau's way of looking at it as, as pessimistic. 
Uh, Thoreau had an interesting comment about networks also. When the first Atlantic telegraph cable went in in the, uh, about 1865 or so, they asked him what he thought about it, and he said he thought he would be afraid that he might find out that some European princess had just gotten a new hat. And so he correctly anticipated the inability of people to use technologies seriously, but in fact they would use it for uh, all sorts of general uh, human concerns and there would be a real tendency towards uh, triviality and that has certainly happened today. And for me, uh, I started off in uh, math and science. I was a math major and a molecular biology major in the mid 60s and Around 1966, I saw the first real computer graphics program that Ivan, Ivan Sutherland had done a few years before. It was called Sketchpad. And it was a completely different use of computers than I was used to, because I was used to programming big mainframes. And here was a, a system that was done on a big mainframe, but basically what was interesting was a 10 inch by 10 inch display on which you could draw things, you could give them behaviors, sometimes mathematical behaviors, and this system would simulate them dynamically. So this is a completely different way of looking at uh, computing, and my reaction to this was to think of this as if you extended it, you could do all computing that way, and so I came up with this idea of dynamic objects. And next thing I saw was Engelbart's version of personal computing, which was not unlike what we have today, this picture was taken in 1966. There he is with the mouse he invented. He's on a black and white display and he's dealing with hyperlinked documents and he's collaborating with people uh, up in Oregon from California. And so he's doing something that is uh, like the web, maybe a little bit superior to it uh, about 40 years ago. And the idea I got from that was uh, boy, this is hard to do on time sharing, so uh, maybe we should do it on a desktop computer. And so this wasn't the first personal computer, but it was a pretty modern looking one and had a pointing device and a multiple windowed screen and so forth. And because this flex machine that Ed Cheadle and I did were, was aimed at uh, non-computer professionals, I started visiting people who had been working with non-computer professionals, and the most interesting person I found was Seymour Papert, who'd been working with children. Papert was a mathematician like I was, and uh, he started doing some really profound things with kids, not just having them make pictures on the screen, but actually thinking about these pictures in a mathematical way, and using an advanced form of mathematics called differential geometry that uh, was actually paradoxically much easier for children to understand. And so uh, Seymour would take a young child and get them to close their eyes and walk in a circle with their body and ask them what they were doing. And they would say, well, I'm going a little and turning a little over and over. And in Logo, going a little is uh, forward and turning a little is turn five and over and over again is repeat. And so if you tell a turtle to do this, then the turtle will make a, a perfect circle. It doesn't need Cartesian coordinates. Uh, it doesn't even need a center because a circle is that geometric figure that has constant curvature. And so I thought this is the best idea that anybody had ever had for computing, which is here is an area where it actually went beyond the book to be able to embody a special kind of powerful mathematics in a way that uh, very young children uh, could learn it. So I got very excited about that and my reaction to this was to uh, draw a cartoon on the plane home that showed a couple of kids sitting out in the middle of a grass field having just programmed their own game of space war and learned about uh, F equals MA and other parts of physics uh, and there are little Dynabooks here are communicating each other with wireless communication, which the research community I was embedded in at that time, the ARPA research community, had been working on the ARPANET and uh, had also started on a wireless version. 
And so I had this notion that finally there is a, a real reason for thinking ahead, that there would be uh, machines like this Dynabook and uh, that we could make them inexpensively enough for children and we could uh, try a lot of Seymour Papert's ideas on them. And then right after that, uh, this idea and a bunch of others from other people uh, got concentrated at Xerox Park, and here's a cardboard model I made of the, that uh, cartoon idea, and we decided to build a, uh, a desktop computer again, but one that was kind of like what the Dynabook was going to be, and we invented uh, much of the uh, modern technology that you use today. So we had object-oriented programming, and dynamic animation, and the Windows user interface, and desktop publishing, and the Ethernet, the laser printer, uh, we invented part of the internet, and so forth. So there's a whole suite of technologies here. And looking ahead to just a few years ahead, that set of inventions done at Xerox Park was done by only two dozen people. And the reason two dozen people were able to do all that is the technology had changed from discrete transistors to integrated circuits that had enough components on them so that relatively small numbers of people could build computers all by themselves. And the next revolution along these lines is happening now and uh, is just starting to be seen in the, in the marketplace. But by about 10 years from now, not just displays will be made out of conductive plastics, but actually the entire computer. And these conductive plastics, some of them can actually be made on something like an ink inkjet printer sitting right on your desk. So you can imagine now a high school student or a college student or a computer scientist or somebody anywhere in the world who gets an idea for a computer, uh, both hardware and software, and can make the entire thing uh, just on their desktop. Um, so this is going to be an absolute revolution in both the cost of what it takes to make computers, but also who will be able to make them. And so if we think about what is behind all this, it's, as Mick Jagger would say, it's only math and science. So essentially what's happening here is we, instead of requiring 200,000 people to make an Egyptian pyramid out of old material, what we basically need are uh, five to 10 to 15 people who really know how to deal with the, both the physical and the informational universe, and that is sufficient to allow uh, entirely new uh, inventions to be made and spread around. And so if we look at these three slides together and think about uh, the third world or the non-developed world, what this says is that the development in the non-developed world can primarily take place through education by learning new points of view and new ways of using the points of view. That the, the need for huge steel mills or a billion dollar integrated circuit factories to make computers uh, or uh, in the realm of biology uh, of rather large installations to uh, make fermentations of various kinds of bacteria and stuff. This is actually going to change to something that's more like a kitchen science. And the key to it is going to be the points of view and the kinds of knowledge that people can uh, exert. So we're talking about an education revolution here. Now most people in the uh, sort of regular world, world prize IQ. So Leonardo is very justly celebrated for having a high IQ. And, but we have to ask, what, what would it be like if you were born with an IQ of 500, and, but in 10,000 BC? How far would you get? How far did Leonardo get with his huge IQ born when he was born? He designed many, many machines, but he couldn't invent a single engine for any of them that would make them work. He was born in the wrong time, and his IQ wasn't strong enough to surmount the general knowledge of the 
of the time. And so knowledge tends to trump IQ and always has, but basically there's so much different kinds of knowledge. People have had knowledge of different kinds for hundreds of thousands of years, and so it's not so much the knowledge that is important, but the outlook. And I'm going to come back to this because the outlook that we have about what we think knowledge is, how we think we can get it, uh, how we trust the knowledge and how we distrust the knowledge, how we teach the knowledge and so forth is actually the, the key to making progress here. In the last couple of years, we've seen the start of Real Computers for Children, thanks primarily to Nicholas Negroponte, who uh, was the spearhead behind the One Laptop Per Child XO, and this kind of got some companies first to be against the idea, but then to develop versions of their own, like the Intel Classmate here. And uh, there are others appearing on the scene now that Nicholas has made it a topic of conversation and gotten other people to realize that children are uh, a huge uh, potential market and also a huge untapped resource for making the world better. Uh, companies like Nokia who make a million phones a day, more than 400 million phones a year, are another example of a, another technology that is actually going to kind of converge with inexpensive communications technologies with displays with enough pixels to allow uh, thoughts about education to seriously uh, be thought about in the next uh, several years. So this is something that's happening right now. The OLPC has just started uh, their first real mass build a couple of days ago. And, and I'm sure that there are some talks about the OLPC at your conference. When we look at this idea of children's computers and look at what's easy and what's hard, the easiest thing is actually to make the computer itself. Even though it was kind of a monumental task over the last few years, it was still done by a few dozen people uh, and uh, perhaps a hundred people at Quanta, the com company that's making it. So it's not that difficult to do technology today and the system software and so forth uh, is also a fair amount of work, but it's definitely doable. And where things start to get harder here is in thinking about the environments for the children and really harder to start thinking about uh, how we can teach children non-trivial ideas. And they get almost intractable when we start asking questions, but who is going to help the child learn these things? Where are the mentors? Where are the teachers? Where are the informed parents? And this question right now is somewhat unanswerable in the first and second worlds. In the developed worlds, we don't have enough elementary school teachers who understand real math and real science. And we certainly don't have enough uh, well-informed teachers in the developing world. So I believe this is actually the, the problem that is going to have to be solved in order for all the rest of this stuff to make sense. And of course, most of the attention so far is being directed at the easy parts of the problem and the most physical parts of the problem and, and so forth. The more invisible parts of the problem uh, are just starting to surface now that uh, these machines are starting to show up in various countries and people are wondering, well, what can we do with them? So we take, a, again, a look at the difference between IQ, knowledge, and the outlook of it. One of the big changes in history was kind of the outlook from thinking of most causes and effects that are important as, as having a kind of a spiritual or a magical background. Actually, our, our human brains are very set up by nature to assign uh, superstitious, spiritual, uh, and uh, magical causes to things. So most of humanity, for most of the time we've been on the planet, has had various theories about the world that, that are <clears throat> kind of propelled by angels, if you will. 
And uh, the Greeks started a revolution in thinking by trying to connect thoughts to get together in a, in a kind of a way that's uh, it's kind of like articulating gears. So when you turn one gear, it actually causes a lot of other things to happen. And Greek mathematics was very, very much like that. But of course, there's more to a revolution in thinking than just uh, creating gear-like causes and, a, and effects. Gear-like causes and effects gives us engineering, but it doesn't give us science. So we have to deal with what's wrong with our brains in order to get the science. And a good example of this is to uh, think about the assertion that the shape and sizes of these tabletops is exactly the same, uh, but we can't see it. This one looks long and skinny, this one looks fat. But we can kind of prove it by picking up uh, one of the tabletops here, and uh, we can rotate this guy around. If I do it just carefully, you can see it just fits nicely there. And in fact, I originally got this tabletop from over here and rotated it to put it over there. So this is an interesting problem here that we actually uh, are fooled in a way that we cannot see even after it's proven that we're fooled. I have done this hundreds of times and I still see this as long and skinny and this is short and fat. So, And another thing about our brain is it's basically about dealing with now and simple changes in now and simple extrapolations. So almost everything we think about when there's a change, it has this simple incremental way of uh, thinking about it, but usually we're actually embedded in something like this, particularly in the last few hundred years and particularly in the last 50 years. And we just can't see this guy without something special. Just as an artist would have to measure those tabletops in order to draw them accurately, we have to do measurements and use mathematics in order to be able to see something that looks like this is actually uh, one of these guys. And far too many uh, politicians, both past, present, and I'm afraid in the future, are going to be fooled by this. So again, our common sense is to aggregate things. So when we think about what can we make from bricks, the simple way of aggregating bricks is in a pile or in a uh, kind of a stack. If we make big aggregates that way, we get Egyptian pyramids or big walls. But what we don't get, and what some of the smarter civilization in history, like the Greeks, didn't get, is non-obvious combinations of these bricks, and partly because the powerful idea that there could be non-obvious things hadn't really surfaced yet. So here's an obvious way of dealing with bricks, and you can sort of see why it's difficult to invent the notion of an arch, because in order to make an arch, you actually have to make a lot more than is here when you get done. So there's a whole scaffolding that goes in, the bricks are laid on top of it, you drop the keystone in, you put some uh, more bricks around this wall and then you subtract out the scaffolding and everything stays up and is both light and powerful. So you can make very big structures, structures the size of the pyramid uh, from about a millionth the amount of, of material by having one of these architectural ideas. And much of modern thinking is actually a shift from simple, simple aggregations of things to uh, new kinds of architectures. Anthropologists have studied human beings for maybe 150 years now, and one of the things that they found is that all human groups, maybe they've looked at three or 4,000 human groups, have a set of traits that is the same from group to group. So every group has gotten good at coping, that's why they're still around. They cope partly through cultural knowledge, they're social, they have a language, a culture, they have fantasies, they tell stories, they have tools, art, technologies, and so forth. Whole bunch of things over here that are common. Every culture has a somewhat different actual, cultures have different actual religions, they have different actual stories. Uh, but the 
general traits here are the same from human being uh, to human being. And so once you lay out these human universals, it's interesting to look into various cultures around the world for things that are universal. And you find things like this. For instance, the notion of progress is modern. It's not, a, not an old idea at all because in the old days you were just trying to survive. You weren't trying to progress at all. And almost all of the strategies uh, in traditional cultures are for, for coping rather than progressing. Uh, most people have lived and died on the earth without ever learning to read and write, without having a deductive abstract mathematics, model-based science, and so forth. Equal rights is an invention. There's no traditional culture that anthropologists have ever found that has this idea, particularly for women. And so you get these rare ideas over here that are almost certainly human inventions. And if you think about it, much of civilization depends on learning these things rather than these. And much of modern education is about trying to teach these things because they're generally more difficult to learn and they're more difficult to teach because they're less natural than these human universals. So a lot of what we should be thinking about when we're trying to uh, deal with education and make uh, positive changes in education is how can we do this stuff better? How can we find more of these guys better? So another McLuhan idea here is one I really like. He says, don't worry about whether it's right or wrong. Just try to find out what is going on. And what he might, means here is that right or wrong, we think of as absolutes, but they're always relative to our belief structures. And if there's one thing that we've learned over the last four or five hundred years is that things we believed a few hundred years ago have turned out not to be so. And many of the most disastrous things we've done over the last few hundred to a few thousand years have been because of incorrect beliefs. So science is a way of trying to get around our tendency to believe in things and trying to find out what's going on. So this is great general advice from Marshall McLuhan. And in the wonderful uh, OLPC-XO, we have a real chance to do things that are like logo, like Mitchell Resnick's star logo, and like the small talk stuff that we did at, at Xerox Park a long time ago. So we can actually experience uh, some of these ideas by using our uh, XO. I'm using the eToy software that runs on the XO here to have this little car here that is uh, going to be driven by this little script here. So the speed is um, always going to be 30, and I'm going to increase the car's position by, uh, 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 by the car's speed each time. So if I let it run here, I get a trail of dots because the speed is constant and the dots are uh, 30 apart. So if I change the speed each time, for instance, if I say, well, let's increase the speed by 30 each time and let the car run, what does it look like? And the car just takes off and I get this pattern that shows that in this unit time we went this far, in this unit time we went that far plus 30, and this time we went that far plus 30, and so forth. So I get a kind of a visual pattern of what the uh, uh, accelerated uh, speed looks like. And if I do that with some children a couple of months before a physical experiment, we can get some interesting results. So here's a, uh, a bunch of fifth graders. And the objects that you think will fall to the earth at the same time. <laughs> Okay. Oh, do not pay any attention to what anybody else is doing. <laughs> 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 What 
Okay, I think we should do the shot put and the sponge ball because they're two totally different weights and if you drop them at the same time, maybe they'll drop at the same speed. Drop. In every classroom, Galileo kid, here it was a little girl who jumped to the same conclusion that Galileo did uh, 400 years ago, which is, uh, well, we what we should do is actually just try dropping a heavy one and a light one and we can hear whether they hit the ground at the same time or not and uh, so obviously I, Aristotle did not ask a child and St. Thomas Aquinas did not ask a child either because he believed what Aristotle said and so perhaps Galileo was the first adult in history to be able to think like uh, children can think kind of an interesting commentary then we can look at this closer by taking a movie. So here's a movie of the ball dropping. And we can see when it's, when it's dropping continuously, it's hard to see what's going on. And even when we, even when we single step it, it's hard to see what's going on. But if we look at every fifth frame here, we can see a little bit more what's going on. And if we stack up those fifth, every fifth frames, we can see a pattern here that when the children see that, they say, oh, acceleration. And so the question is, is uh, how, uh, so how to measure the acceleration. And what they do here is by measuring from the bottom of one ball on this frame to the bottom of the ball here, or measuring from the bottom here to here. And so they get something like this. And if they stack these, uh, these up carefully, this gets harder as they get older. If you stack these up like this, then they say, oh, the excess from here to here is this strip, and the excess from the yellow one to the next one is this, and the excess from the next one to this one, and that's constant. And so this pattern is a pattern of constant acceleration. And let's listen to how Tyrone actually did this. Sure that I was doing it just right. I got a magnifier, which would help me figure out if the size was just right. After I'd done that, I would go and click on the little basic category button, and then a little menu would pop up, and one of the categories would be geometry, so I click on that. And here it has many things that have to do with the size and shape of the rectangle. So I would see what the height is. And I kept going along the process until I had them all lined up with their height. I subtracted the smaller one's height from the big one to see if there was a kind of pattern anywhere that could help me and my best guess worked. So in order to show that it was working, I decided to leave a dot copy so that it would show that the ball was going at the exact right speed and acceleration. This is pretty cool. He decides to drop a dot from his simulated ball and shows that it matches up with the stacked frames here. Uh, another way to, to do this is to uh, run a movie and the animation at the, uh, at the same time. So by the way, 70% of college students fail to understand Galileo and gravity, but most fifth graders that we've worked with uh, using this way of doing it, this kind of mathematics and this kind of approach, and doing their own simulations um, on the OLPC machine uh, are able to understand it much, much better than most college students. And so a payoff here is this little gravity script that they come up with uh, can be used to uh, make things move 
the way gravity makes things move uh, on things more interesting than balls, like a spaceship. So they start that script running on the spaceship. It will be drawn down to the <laughs> surface of the moon and will, will uh, crash. But we can add a motor here. So we can think of velocity, uh, gravity as a velocity eater and a motor as a velocity producer. We have a little script here to show a flame from the rocket ship when the uh, uh, motor is on. And this little script decides whether there's a crash or not if the ship is going too fast when it hits. So if I start the game and grab onto the joystick here, you see I can oppose the gravity here and land it carefully and not get a crash this time. This is a game people used to pay money with. So another way of thinking about things is that simple cause and effect relationships like gears don't scale very well. So you can build a clock perhaps out of a thousand gears, but then it gets really complicated to build more complicated things out of gears. And uh, simple connect connections of wires between things starts getting really complicated. This is an actual room, I won't say where, and there's a sign here that says, do not touch any of these wires. Uh, so the research group I was part of, the ARPA Park research group, uh, realized that you can replace any mess like this with a simple message sending network like an ethernet or an internet. And all things large and small that have to be connected together can be connected uh, in a very simple way. And this simple way is actually a looser coupling way than tightly tying wires together. This is another outlook that we have to think about. So here's a really ex simple example of using the gravity uh, thing we just discovered. So the gravity is working on the, uh, that green uh, line goes. You can think of it as being a lid on top of these atoms. The atoms are being moved around because they're hot. Temperature is motion. And they're exchanging momentum with the, uh, the green lid. And so they're keeping that lid up. And we have a 1,000 of these going. So this is a, a, using a version of, of uh, uh, Mitchell Resnick's star logo that we made in Squeak. So if I turn that turtle count into uh, 500 here, the weight of this lid is being pushed upwards by half the number of uh, molecules. And so what happens is we have a uh, pressure decrease that lowers this thing about halfway down. You can see uh, this. If I put in, uh, say, uh, 2,000 here, I get a, an explosion. and some nice shock waves. But eventually settles into an equilibrium that's about twice what it was with a thousand. So we can see some simulations here of Boyle's Law done with this uh, very nice, simple uh, computer simulation that uh, children can easily make up to understand how aggregates of lots of things actually work together. And this extends our notion of outlook. So the outlook of Newtonian physics and some of much of 18th century and some of 19th century physics and a lot of the ways we teach mathematics and science today is kind of this uh, very uh, tightly bound uh, cause and effect relationship. But the latter part of the 20th century in many, many ways has gotten much more biological. So we can think of this as a transition from gears to biology. And uh, this transition is not just in the, the world of molecular biology, but also the internet is made this way and object-oriented programming is made this way. It's kind of a no centers, distributed, loose coupling way of uh, modeling things. And so this, way of thinking about things is the probably the most
comprehensive, most powerful way we have of thinking about complexity today. And so it's natural to try and think as hard as possible about how we might help children uh, learn this. And one of the ways of doing this is by having them make ever more complex models on the computer and to see the unintended uh, emerging uh, properties that come from dealing with uh, many objects loosely coupling, working together. So we've all heard about the blind men and the elephant trying to figure out what it is. And if there's an elephant in education, uh, modern education today, that element is mathematics. Uh, the last couple of years I've been traveling around talking to teachers at various uh, levels in the United States. And in the United States at least, if there's a, a common denominator to why things aren't happening in both math and science, it's basically at the root is that the adults who teach children generally lack fluency in mathematical thinking. And I don't mean uh, knowledge of mathematics. Some adults have some knowledge of mathematics. But to be a the ability to think uh, heuristically, to be able to represent things that haven't been represented before, to think about relationships between them, and all of the things that are kind of the background knowledge and skills of mathematics and of modern science are pretty much lacking for most of the K through 12 teachers that I've talked to. Mathematical heuristic thinking or uh, problem solving heuristic thinking or looking at things from multiple points of view heuristic thinking is one of the biggest problems that we have to face in the, in the future, at least in the United States. Uh, another problem, again in the United States, but I think affecting everywhere is this idea of amusing ourselves to death. My friend Neil Postman wrote a great book about it. If he were to write that book today, I think he would retitle it Distracting Ourselves to Death. Because one of the ways we're using electronic media is to make an enormous amount of different kinds of experiences that attract our uh, cave person brains in a way. And many of these experiences are keyed into these human universals of things that we want to do. We want to communicate with other people. We want to go to the theater. We want to tell stories and so forth. And now we've been able to multiply that with the power of the Industrial Revolution. And it's produced an incredible uh, set of distractors. For instance, there's now a television show in the United States that is a contest for people playing air guitar with the uh, game Guitar Hero. So this has gone from being a fantasy game to something that is now an actual pursuit by people who are very, very far from learning anything about actually playing a, playing a guitar. So this is a, a real disaster. And a nice quote here is, the bull wears itself out on the cape and fails to see the sword. So if we're going to make big changes in education, we have to somehow get aware of the cape and concentrate more on uh, what's important with our limited amount of time and our limited ability to use our brains. And finally, uh, maybe one of the biggest trends I see happening today, again because of electronic media and because of a uh, everybody becoming aware of everybody else is this thing that goes to the root of what it means to be a human being and especially a human being in a traditional society. As it's, for most people, they're trying to live their life in the present and the meaning of life is too abstract for them. You could think about a lot of what our uh, impulses towards civilization have been uh, since the Greeks and particularly in the last few hundred years as trying to go from just experiencing being alive which everybody has for the last 200 years to trying to get more of a handle on what the meaning of life could be 
I think we know enough today to realize that the meaning of life is something that we can make up. It's part and parcel of what it means, for example, to uh, say that people should have equal rights and to try and teach children to believe in equal rights and to uh, try to act as though equal rights are something that is naturally in the world rather than something that we've made up. So I think this change from naturalistic living to a more artificial but perhaps uh, richer, perhaps nicer, perhaps more productive, perhaps more progressive uh, form of living is the kind of thing I at least would like to strive for and I hope uh, everybody else who's interested in helping children learn powerful ideas uh, will get interested in also. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm sorry not to be there, but I was glad to make this video for you, and uh, I hope it helps you think about uh, what it means to have a personal computer for every child on the planet. Thank you.